Welcome to our audience with CCS. This conversation is part of a Sensafili report on small cell backhaul that gives an update on the small cell backhaul solutions available today and the evolution of mobile operators' requirements. My name is Lance Hiley. I'm here on behalf of Sensafili, and I'm joined today by Steve Greaves, co-founder and CEO of CCS, which was uh, founded by the same team that started Adaptive Broadband Corporation and Cambridge Broadband Networks Limited. CCS is looking to bring to market a small form factor backhaul solution that's self-organizing, addressing many of the challenges currently being discussed in small cell backhaul forums. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Steve. And Steve, perhaps you could start off by just explaining the background of your company and uh, the product that you're trying to bring to market. Yes, hi, Lance. Um, yes, so we started the company in 2010, myself and my co-founder, John Porter. As you pointed out, we've co-founded Adaptive Broadband and Cambridge Broadband previously. And originally, we're out of the ATT Stroke Car Laboratories in Cambridge under Andy Hopper. Uh, we started uh, looking at a uh, this market space, as I say, in 2010. And one of the first things that we did, we um, instead of developing the technology and taking that to the market, uh, we, we asked the market what is the right technology to develop. So we spent a lot of time in the early days with uh, operators in the UK, operators in the US, operators in Asia, just finding out what exactly it was um, uh, they saw as a problem going forward. Um, and that focused on, on, on particularly on small cells. I mean, they came up with quite quickly with the problem of small cell, and particularly small cell backhaul. So bear in mind, this was 2010. So we went away and we, uh, we looked at the, the, the possible solutions, possible ways of creating small cell backhaul. And by backhaul, we mean microwave backhaul. Uh, and that's how we develop the product that we have now. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks, Steve. Um, would you um, say that the um, solution that you're designing is designed for urban metro environments, or are you looking to roll something out um, that can address um, small cells in rural environments as well? Because a lot of operators have said that uh, they see small cells as being a way of uh, providing a uh, mobile broadband coverage to underserved communities. Yes. Yes, so we, we predominantly, I mean, looking at our solution, we originally looked at the problem. The problem was definitely an, uh, a dense urban um, problem that we, we, we set out to address. Uh, and we addressed that by looking at the uh, types of technology uh, and to determine that the best way to deploy would be a, um, a, a small cell sits back hole system was a many point to many point. Uh, uh, so we needed high capacity, low latency. We have 450 megabits, um, 125 microsecond latency, and that's how we originally started thinking. Uh, but but uh, but recently we've been asked to look at uh, less dense urban environments, such as um, suburban, and our system will also run in a point to multipoint mode. So so generically, it's a uh, a multipoint system. So we do see pr pri primarily the big market being dense urban, uh, small cell backhaul, but we do have capability to deal with semi-urban, longer range um, um, small cells or even s uh, lightly loaded macro base stations uh, with a point to multipoint type strategy. Um, if you're going to be able to cover uh, both dense urban and um, you know lesser dense urban like suburban environments as you mentioned um, what what spe spectrum bands will you be using um, to provide um, um, the, the solution to cover both of those scenarios or, you, or will you be using a variety of bands well, we, we originally looked at um, um, the requirements of uh, dense urban and also to some degree uh, suburban it's really area based so so you want to be able to deploy small cells in a very very a uh, quick way, and also this, this is true of macros actually, you want to deploy them in a very, very quick way. So you don't want to be uh, de deploying licenses for every link. So what you have to do is you have to find an, a, a spectrum that has the attribute of being able to be deployed in, in very quickly. And the bands that we're working are predominantly um, higher microwave bands, um, 26, 28, 32, and 42. Our initial offering is in 28 gigahertz. And the, the nice thing about these frequency bands is that they are area-based. So you go to the operator, you purchase a license for a geographic region, and that's when, once you have that, you can do what you want. So that also that works very well for, for small cells, because small cells, you can have a lot more uh, deployment activity than you say with a conventional uh, macro-type um, uh, base station deployment. But it also works as well for larger, longer scale, long, longer range deployments, such as suburban. So the idea is you keep the operator out of your hair, basically, and, and then you, you can just continually deploy as you wish. So 
the, the initial bands we looked at were 28 and, um, and uh, as I say we will look at other bands in these areas. Uh, we did initially look at things like 60 gigahertz. Um, we like the attributes of 60 gigahertz, particularly being uh, unlicensed, particularly having high capacity, low latency. Uh, we, we found some issues, we felt there'd be some issues with deployment. I mean our, our system is really focused on on the total cost of ownership rather than optimizing on a link by link basis. So we feel that the attribute of the 28 gigahertz band being area based means we can build a radio based system that has a nice uh, easy, easy to install feel about the whole thing. We looked also looked at sub 6 and predominantly uh, w when we think of sub 6 we think of um, unlicensed kind of 5 gig uh, but there are other bands there that, that are of interest um, but again what we felt with sub 6 is that they, that they have a very nice attribute of being very easy to install you know you turn up switch them on and they work uh, but this, the, there are potential issues with performance um, and, and interference and they have to be managed in a, in a very very careful way if you if you want to optimize the network and managing it in a very very careful way implies time implies opex so so what we've tried to do is merge both technologies both best attributes of both technologies the ease of install of the sub six and the high capacity low latency of the the, the, the higher bands and create a solution that sits somewhere in the middle so we have high capacity low latency but the key to our system is that you turn up install it switch it on and it works so so and how we achieve that is really this the concept of self organization self organization from our point of view means no frequency planning ease of installation ease of growth of network and, and scalability uh, and that's really the, the focus and why we chose this particular frequency band okay um I guess uh, the, the thing that sort of jumps out at me um, when you talk about using microwave spectrum in the, you know, say for example, 28 gigahertz range is that that's very much a line of sight spectrum. And um, so, so how, how are you actually building a self-organizing multipoint network that's operating on a line of sight basis in a, in a dense urban environment? And, and why do you feel that that's a better approach to, than some of the other approaches that are being um, put forward by uh, wireless backhaul vendors today? Okay, so it's, um, it's essentially builds a mesh type architecture. So, um, so we, we would like to have line of sight between at least one lamppost or two lampposts. So wherever a small cell can see another small cell, then, then we have a, a line of sight connectivity. When we looked at the types of deployment scenarios for, for dense urban uh, small cells, we rapidly realized that the, the actual ranges that people were talking about were, were anything from three, three, four hundred meters down to as low as 50 meters. Uh, and in fact, when, you, when you're at street level, actually getting line of sight beyond that is quite difficult. There are a number of maybe, maybe uh, particular deployments where you can see further than that, but the majority of deployments are, are, are really short range. So obtaining line of sight between, um, between lampposts or street furniture is actually quite simple if you can build a network that can adapt and route around these objects. So, so our first premise was really that our system would be, be deployed such that we could be mu a multiplicity of redundant paths that would effectively route around um, um, a non-line of sight objects. So the mesh itself provides non-line of sight capability by having short ops that are in the individual line of sight. That was the first thing. But secondly, we, we've, we've also discovered, and this is quite recently, that we, we do actually work with, um, with bouncers as well. So uh, we've done a number of trials where, where our network's adopted to a, a reflective path rather than a, 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 a direct path. So there is some scope for what we might call near line of sight uh, or reflected line of sight, effectively. We're not really saying that we have deep non-line of sight capability, which is strongly diffracted, because that requires you know, quite a big link budget to do that, quite a lot of power in your system to do that. So, so we are actively investigating some some non line of sight techniques that what well, techniques would be normally associated with, associated with line of sight, but predominantly we would like to see a line of sight link between a small cell backhaul point to another small cell backhaul point. And as I say, we build up non line of sight capabilities by by effectively routing around um, um, obstacles. And in fact, you know, if if I, if I step back and look at the current non line of sight systems that are running or the Wi-Fi based systems that are running at high performance and, and um, uh, they tend to be deployed in that mode anyway. They effectively build up line of sight links and routes around in the same way we're talking about. To actually achieve true non-line of sight um, capability, deep non-line of sight capability requires a large link margin effectively and, uh, and, and it's very difficult to have 
you know, non line of sight uh, capability and also high capacity, low latency. Those two are quite difficult things to, uh, to achieve. So what we've said is, okay, we'll achieve it, but we'll do it in this particular way. We'll assume we have a line of sight or some, some uh, bounce line of sight, but we will, we will focus on delivering a high capacity individual link. So we, we have the, the capability of a microwave link, but the deployable ease of a non line of sight system. And really that's what, we'll, you know, that's the approach you take. Okay. I mean, that, that sounds very sophisticated. I mean, you're talking about a meshing network, self-organizing, um, lots of nodes which are working on a point-to-point -point or a point-to-multi-point um, point line-of-sight basis. Um, surely that's going to be difficult to install into a line. No, again, again, sort of the, one of the attributes, the nice attributes of 28 gigahertz is you can build a system that requires minimum alignment. So, and, and that's simply because you have a higher link budget, so you can have sort of an, antenna antenna arrangements that don't require um, a, a, a focused alignment. And one of our driving principles behind this, this has to be installed by semi-skilled people. So, so it doesn't matter if somebody installs it and it's slightly misaligned. I've got one of the units here. So, you know, if we put one of these things up and it's kind of slightly off or, 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 or skewed slightly, it doesn't make any difference. We've got two seventy degrees coverage on this thing, and uh, and effectively it can be installed by anybody with no alignment because we feel that 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 side of it, the kind of the, the time to install a particular unit multiplied by the thousands that we'll be looking at in the future, is really it really has to be managed. So so we 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 aim to have ease of alignment. In fact, our system is now being deployed by council electricians in about thirty minutes. That's thirty minutes from turning up at the lamppost. With their cherry picker, you know, in raising the cherry picker, installing the unit, powering the unit up, switching it on, it all comes up. It's aligned with the system uh, within 30 minutes. So, so we're we're actually delivering now on what we originally viewed the system should be able to do, uh, and that's caused quite a, a you know a, quite a a good reaction from the operators that we've been working with. So that is really it. You know, the, the key thing is that you have to be able. You know, people to install this in, in a quick manner with no radio planning, no frequency planning, just turn up and do this because the alternative is, you know, a huge round of radio planning with expensive databases, deployment, handcrafting the network, moving things around, and, and then reiterating that whole cycle till it works. And then when you want to uh, reinstall a small cell or add to the network, you have to do the whole thing again. So, so definitely, it sounds complicated, and it is complicated. The sort of software that sits over it is very complicated. The whole aim of it is to make it very easy for the operator. No, that's. I mean, I, I that, that makes a certain amount of sense, you know, because as you say, it's uh, you know, you, you've got two hundred and seventy degrees of coverage. I assume you've got a certain amount of. Um, um, uh, beam width as well that makes uh, it a little bit easier in terms of you know where you position it on the lamp post as well if you're using relatively unskilled uh, people to install the systems literally just plug it in that must have a, a pretty good knock-on effect as far as um, you know the capex is concerned and you know what it costs to install what kind of other um, uh, financial benefits would you say that your architecture and your system approach would bring an operator well, first thing, just in terms of stepping back to talk about the capex, one of the things that we we did from a very early stage is we um, we viewed this as as a volume product. I mean, conventional microwave may do a million units a year. We said this is going to be bigger than that, so we have to be able to get to a certain cost point. So we have to think about what we put into the unit from day one. So we had conversations very early on with um, with radio uh, component vendors, silicon vendors, saying, "Look, this is where we need to get to. This is the product. This is the market space." Uh, and they had to convince us that they could get to the volume pricing we wanted before we put the components in. That's very different to what we've done in the past. You know, in the past we've been technologists and put the best in and said we'll get cost out later. And you know, ultimately that's a hard thing to do. So we made it hard on ourselves from from day one. We made it hard on ourselves in terms of. We've got this very complicated requirement, and we've, we've managed to achieve it on a limited, skinny hardware budget. Uh, but now that's getting better. You know, that's two years ago, two and a half years ago. Components are getting better. You know, component costs are getting cheaper. So, capex point of view, we worked very hard to make sure that we could get this into a volume volume uh, product. So, capex, we know where we're going. With that in terms of the installation, clearly there are a number of things. First, the first and foremost, 
uh, as all operators talk about, is that it has to be easy to install. You know, we, we, we've not invented this concept of self-organization. This is where the RANs are going. So we borrowed from the RAN technology and said, look, if these guys need to do it, we need to do it, because ultimately maybe one-to-one -one ratio with these small cells. So that's what we did. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is we talked earlier about uh, keeping out of the regulators hair by using area-based licensing. But if you're not very, very careful, you can get into the hair of the planning department, okay, the council planning department, and they can be even more difficult. So one of the things that we did right at the very start again was go and talk to owners of infrastructure, council, and say, well, if we were to put this type of equipment on your infrastructure, you know, what would it have to look like? And of course, we start with this size well, as a technology it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the reason it has to be small is that you know, if you go to places like Westminster, they don't want a lot of infrastructure on their, on their lampposts. So, so we worked very hard to get this, uh, this unit to the right form factor such that we could go to councils and, and get this term de minimis. So we view, you know, we view the, fact, uh, 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 the fact of life is that you will have probably one unit for backhaul and one, unit, one small cell. If you want to put multiple units on there, you're going to have a really, really hard time. And that's going to cause delay in your, your, your rollout and it's going to add to your, your, your general uh, capex and ultimately your opex. So, so ease of installation, from, a, from an, a technical point of view, but also enabling your system to de be deployed without having to wait six months in planning is also very important. Uh, and ultimately cost as well. So they're the three key things we think we bring to uh, an operator. Really, initial capex and then longer term, a, 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 a real reduction in opex and time to market installation time. Okay, uh, well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, in the context, you know, you talked about uh, the evolution of the product getting smaller and smaller. I mean, what sort of things can we look forward to in the future from CCS? Um, do you see your product becoming smaller, being integrated with the uh, the small cell itself, anything like that? Well, uh, there's a number of... So we, we imagine that uh, longer term there will be a decision made to integrate it. But, but at the moment, the operators are telling us that's not required. It's not required. A, because they don't have a small cell strategy. They don't know which particular small cells they're working with. They're not sure on the backhaul strategy, but ultimately I'm sure that will happen. The integration will take place. Whether that's probably not CCS integrating Ericsson equipment, it's probably the other way around, you know, because it's a, it's a bigger problem. But I think at some stage there will be integration. But from our perspective, you know, we, we continually to look at our system. This is quite small, and, and, and really it's, it's actually smaller than it should be for the frequency. So I think there's certain rules of physics that we have to ad adopt, you know, ad adhere to in terms of design of these things. But certainly in capacity, this is a 450 megabit system. We have a capability to put a dual unit, a second unit, which gives us another 450 megabits in the same spectrum. So it's a 900 megabit system. We will look to integrate those when we um, when we have the component um, cost down. So we'll have a higher capacity unit, and we can look at more sophisticated ways of increasing capacity with the same spectrum. So that's one thing. Obviously, frequency is a, 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 a great interest. Certainly, we talked about 26, 28, 32, 42. There's about six and a half gigahertz of spectrum around the world that's you know, mandated for use in this area, but very lightly used. So that's you know that's a good area to move in. So capacity, I think, in terms of um, and, and uh, in, uh, capacity, and also different frequency bands, and uh, possibly possibly longer term integration, maybe with uh, with a non-line of sight technology, maybe a kind of sub-6 technology as well. These are all things that are, are all possible for, for a team like ourselves, but our key focus at the moment is really just making sure this system is functioning as we say it functions and, and moving from the, the phase we're at now, which is really kind of commercial pilots through to commercial stages. And I must say we've got sufficient interest in this product to keep us going for a little while. Well, that's, that's great, Stephen. Thank you very much. Your comments and observations will be a great contribution to this uh, Sensafili report. Um, and just to remind everyone, this report um, will be accompanied by in-depth interviews, much like this from, from uh, a variety of leading vendors um, um, working in the backhaul area. The report will be f available to be downloaded free from the Sensafili website at uh, sensafiliconsulting.com. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank Steve Breeds from CCS again for his contribution today, and we look forward to hearing about uh, many more exciting developments from your company. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Lance.